Okay, members, it's time for questions to the Executive Office, and uh, we will start with the list of questions. First of all, questions four and eight have been withdrawn. Topical questions one and nine have been withdrawn, and there are no groupings we have been indicated to. So uh, I call Gary Middleton. Question number one, Mr. Speaker. And can I, just before I respond, take this opportunity to acknowledge um, the passing of Harry Gregg, who died today. Harry was a great sporting icon and a role model, and my thoughts are with his family and friends at this time. I'm pleased to advise the member that the Brexit subcommittee is now firmly established and is working to ensure that our interests are being protected and that we get the best deal for us. The subcommittee has met twice, and further meetings are scheduled over the coming days and weeks. At our first meeting, we received an update from officials on what they identified as the key challenges facing us. We also agreed a work schedule to ensure that we are focusing our efforts in the most appropriate areas, although it was recognised that our consideration of issues will be informed by the timetable of the negotiations processes. At our second meeting, we had a focused consideration of the issues around the movement of goods east-west in both directions, and given the importance of this issue, we will give further consideration to our position at the next meeting. We also considered the implications for services north-south, as well as how we could appropriately engage with stakeholders in recognition of the established and ongoing stakeholder engagement undertaken by the various departments. We also received a paper from officials on draft and negotiating, uh, negotiating principles for the executive, which will be discussed at detail or in detail at our next meeting. Call Gary Middleton for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And can I thank the Deputy First Minister for her response so far? Uh, the Deputy First Minister highlighted uh, the importance of ease of trade east-west and west-east. Uh, the, ag the agri sector here in Northern Ireland is crucial to our economy. Our party position is that there should be no checks or infrastructure uh, at all. But would she agree with me that if there's an insistence that there should be checks, that these should not be done on this side of the Irish Sea? Can I just say to the member that I don't wish to see barriers um, east, west, north, south. We don't wish to see any kind of barriers to trade. We want to make sure that we have a prosperous economy and that everybody has an opportunity to flourish. You also will be aware, you, you mentioned the, the agri-food sector and the significance that it has to our local economy, and we have to do everything to protect that sector. We have uh, written to uh, the Prime Minister, to Boris Johnson, both myself and the First Minister, in terms of um, seeking clarity around some of these issues. Um, clearly, we have a protocol that needs to be protected, but also we have to guard against the fact that we could still come to the end of this year and not have a deal. So we need to protect our local interests here. Um, we're determined to work together in terms of that, and we have sought clarity around a whole range of issues from uh, Boris Johnson, and we hope to get that response in the, in the sort of weeks ahead. Nicole, Matthew O'Toole. Speaker, um, I'd like to ask the Deputy First Minister, the Ireland Protocol sets out a joint committee on the implementation of the protocol. It sets out a specialised committee which will report to the joint committee on the operation of the protocol. And once, once the protocol is operational, it envisages a joint consultative working group on the operation of the protocol. Have officials advised her or the First Minister on the membership of those committees and whether there will be executive representation? And if not, when will we find out? Um, can I say to the member that we're working our way through the detail of all of these things. Um, we, both myself and the First Minister, attended the Joint Ministerial Council meeting in Cardiff um, a few weeks ago, where we raised these issues and we raised representation. Uh, the executive voice needs to be heard at these, uh, as part of these discussions. Uh, it isn't uh, definitive yet around the, the organisation of it all, how it, will, how it will operate, but suffice to say that we'll be insisting that our voice is heard and that we're part of the discussions at each stage of the negotiations because it's important that um, as negotiations move and we know that they can move very quickly that our voice is heard and that we're able to adapt to be able to be part of that which is why we are actually meeting as a, a executive subcommittee on Brexit um, every week now just to try and be able to get up to speed with all of that and make sure that all executive ministers are involved in the discussions and the decisions that we need to take. Nicole Martina Anderson. Come here, I'll get a can call you. Uh, given the, the deep and genuine concerns and the widespread discussions that are taking place among a range of stakeholders, the economy, social justice, constitutional change, rights advocates like trade unions and uh, CAG, in the context of participatory democracy, will the Brexit subcommittee, uh, subcommittee that you mentioned undertake engagements with such relevant stakeholders just to listen and possibly learn and to discuss their views on Brexit? Thank the member for her question. And yes, we absolutely recognise the importance of stakeholder engagement. And there are already um, well 
seasoned, good established mechanisms in place to engage with stakeholders within each individual department, but then the subcommittee itself um, aims to build on these. Each department is going to continue to engage with its own stakeholders and the subcommittee will make arrangements to receive um, briefing from key stakeholders as it feels appropriate. The subcommittee will keep stakeholder engagement under review and we're going to consider detailed stakeholder events at certain points between the negotiation phases. So I suppose we have to adapt to the, the process as it unfolds. We, at the last meeting of the Brexit subcommittee, officials have committed to bringing forward proposals on stakeholder engagement for consideration by the subcommittee. And as I said, that's going to build on the already uh, in place established stakeholder engagement within each of the departments. Nicole Andrew Muir. Mr. Speaker, um, can the uh, Deputy First Minister give a guarantee that the Executive and all the Ministers will act faithfully to implement the Northern Ireland Ireland Protocol? Yes, the protocol is established, it's in place, it's an integral part of the withdrawal agreement, so it has to be adhered to. Um, I'm committed to making sure that that is the case. That is why we have a, a Brexit subcommittee, because it is important that every party represented the Executive is part of that. Our, uh, duty here is to try and protect the interests and the livelihoods of the people who live here. Our duty is to make sure that uh, citizens' rights aren't diminished, and our duty is to make sure that our economy can flourish. So that includes the implementation of the protocol, making sure that we have everything in place that needs to be in place, um, because I do think that there is still a danger that at the end of the year that we could have a no-deal scenario. I call Philip McGuigan. Riddle. Question two. I would like to thank the member for his question. While the Department of Justice takes the overall lead on coordinating the executive-wide action plan for tact and paramilitarism, our department has lead responsibility for delivering on four of the 38 actions contained in the plan. Good progress has been made on actions B1, B2 and B3. This has included the civil service implementing the employer's guidance, which sets out best practice in recruiting people with conflict-related convictions. Access to financial services and travel advice have also been improved. Specifically, in relation to Action 4, the Communities in Transition project, the Department, in, the department in, is currently nearing the end of a process to appoint delivery partners to deliver individual projects across eight B4 areas. It's anticipated that all projects will be on the ground by April of this year. The New Decade New Approach deal includes a renewed commitment from all parties to tackle paramilitarism and should be a priority in a revised programme for government. We look forward to working together across the executive in support of this challenging and ambitious programme of work. Phil McGuigan, supplementary. Uh, and I thank the Joint First Minister for her answer uh, and response. Can I ask her if the executive office will review uh, the outworking of the plan to ensure increased uh, community input and increased public confidence? Yes, and again, thanks to the member for his question. The previous executive has developed a cross-cut and action plan to deal with paramilitarism and organised crime, and that is constantly reviewed. The plan placed a focus on developing a range of criminal justice and community empowerment interventions to tackle paramilitarism, criminality and organised crime. Dealing with criminality in all of its manifestations requires a whole community response, and I am acutely aware that people on the ground need to see, need to feel and need to experience change. As the basis for maximising public confidence, I am committed to working with all executive colleagues and also with those in public, civic and community life to ensure that no person is held back from realising their full potential as a consequence of paramilitar paramilitarism or organised criminality in their community. Only by working together will we create a better future, a future where no place for paramilitarism, criminality or organised crime in our communities. I call Trevor Lund. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, but the Minister has beautifully answered the question I was about to ask her already. Thank you, Thank you Mr. Lund. I call Jim Allister. Uh, I hope it is agreed that it's important that the victims of paramilitarism should not be re-traumatised. Can I therefore ask the Deputy First Minister, does she accept that the murder of Paul Quinn was a paramilitary killing? And what steps has she therefore taken to require the Finance Minister to publicly acknowledge that Paul Quinn was not a criminal? Conor Murphy has unreservedly condemned the murder of Paul Quinn and those people that murdered Paul Quinn are criminals and need to be brought to justice. He has called on anyone with information on his murder to bring it to the Gardaí or to the PSNI. 
I know that Connor very much regrets the comments that he made in the aftermath of Paul's murder. He has apologised for his remarks unreservedly. He's withdrew his remarks and his apology was heartfelt and his apology was sincere. He has offered to meet with the Quinn family at a time and place of their convenience. Also, so has Mary Lou Macdonald. I call on, just order, I call on Justin McNulty. Gurma Yogurt Kim Corla. Um, I want to acknowledge the presence of two incredibly brave people in the public gallery today, Bridge and Stephen Quinn. Deputy First Minister, I was pleased to see the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister at the Executive Office Committee confirm that, in their view, in your view, Paul Quinn was not a criminal. Deputy First Minister, can you confirm if that view is held by all ministers in the Executive, including the Finance Minister, Conor Murphy? Again, I have said very clearly that Connor has apologised for his remarks and he has unreservedly withdrew his remarks and his apology was heartfelt and sincere. I believe that the best place to deal with these issues, which are very, very sensitive... ..to deal with these issues, which are very, very sensitive, we're talking about a mother who has been hurt. I, as a mother, can only, can't even begin to understand how you deal with that trauma. So I think the best place and the best way for these things to be dealt with is on a one-to-one -one basis, and Conor Murphy is very happy to meet with Breach Quinn at the earliest opportunity. I call Doug Bailey. Uh, thank you, Mr Chairman. Uh, can I ask the, the First Minister, uh, given that the funding for the action plan on tackling, tackling paramilitarism, organised crime and criminality uh, is due to end... Uh, at the end of the financial year of 2020. Could she outline what discussions she has had with the finance minister in regards for that carrying on and the funding carrying on? I, uh, we haven't had any discussion with the finance minister in relation to this as of yet. Um, we are obviously looking at all these things and we have a scheduled meeting with the finance minister to discuss our priorities as, as the, the executive office. And obviously then as, as we approach the budget, then we hope to obviously get positive outcomes across a whole range of issues, not least just uh, funding this area of work. I call Joanne Bunting. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Does the Deputy First Minister agree with me that in circumstances where uh, agencies, uh, arm's length bodies and dep departmental agencies afford access uh, to these people in another role, that they also are affording credibility to those who have been engaged and therefore uh, it permits these people to still maintain the coercion and control in the areas that the, the tackling paramilitarism programme is trying to uh, reduce all such influence. In circumstances where the Parades Commission, the Housing Executive, the councils and the police continue to meet with these people, it affords them a status and a credibility that the average citizen and, and access that the average citizen is not afforded. Can I just say that we all have a duty and we as an executive have a duty to bring forward the work that we allow communities to transition to make sure that nobody is held back, to make sure we lift communities up, to make sure we create um, distraction, that make sure that no young people are, are drawn towards um, these uh, elements in, in society. Nobody should be held back. So if there are particular issues which the member wishes to write to me about, then I'm more than happy to receive that if there are particular issues in terms of arm's length bodies. I call Mr Melissa McHugh. We're very mindful of the commitments contained in the new decade, new approach uh, document, including the commitment towards further reform of the civil service. Officials will bring forward proposals for the establishment of a dedicated programme to coordinate and drive forward this work in a formal and structured way. Civil service reform will require discussion by the executive and we will keep members updated as this work is taken forward. Melissa McHugh, supplementary. Good morning, uh, uh, and will this review uh, of the civil service be independent and uh, draw on the best practice? Uh, part one of the new decade, new approach document makes reference to further reform of the civil service, and the executive has not yet determined how it wishes to see this taken forward. There are a number of priority themes underpinned by actions which are interlinked and would, in my view, be key principles going forward. Leadership from within the civil service at all levels and from ministers. Collaboration working across all departments and ministers. A high performing civil service. An outcomes focused civil service which is well placed to deliver on our programme for government commitments. An inclusive and dynamic and innovative workforce in which diversity is truly valued. A great place to work and a great place to attract new and young talent. Those are the aims which we and I'm sure all of us would want to support and build upon. I call Colin McGrath.
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, uh, Mr. Speaker, given a review has often means a reduction in staff and extra responsibility for those that are in place, uh, and recognising the fact that there's a current civil service pay dispute, um, what action is the Deputy First Minister and the whole executive undertaking to ensure that we value our civil service staff and that we pay them a decent wage? I know that the Finance Minister has been engaging with civil service side in relation to the pay dispute and we hope to obviously get to a point where we have a positive resolution. We must value our staff, we must invest in our staff. Um, I think that um, that's really, really important and I think that um, the, the Chair of the Committee actually has asked that question and I want to work with the Chair of the Committee around the proposals which we're going to develop in due course around how we can reform and do better in the civil service. I call Claire Billy for her question. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question five. We are aware that the Attorney General's term of appointment will expire on the 30th of June and recently met with him to discuss various issues. We are currently considering the position and will provide an update to the Executive in due course. I call Claire Bailey for supplementary. Thank you. Um, just to follow on then, um, I would like to ask the question that has been unanswered so far from the First and Deputy First Ministers um, to ask if they have any concerns about potential conflicts of interest in relation to the Attorney General's office, given his recent appointment as temporary De Deputy High Court Judge? I'm assuming the member is referring to a written question, which perhaps she hasn't received the answer yet, but I'm, I'm happy to respond to say that we're aware of the potential conflict of interest that could arise between the role of the Attorney General and the role of temporary High Court Judge. The temporary High Court Judge application process provided for a conflict of interest declaration where applicants were required to declare interests and potential conflicts. I also understand that at a point of um, deployment in each, and each case, the potential um, temporary High Court judge to be allocated will be assessed individually by the Lord Chief Justice on a case-by-case -case basis. The First Minister and I are keen to ensure that there are no conflict of interest or perceptions of conflict of interest that may undermine the Attorney General's office or the Executive. I call Jerry Kelly. Um, just maybe further on from that, um, could you go into some detail as to the, the process of recruitment for the new uh, Attorney General? The appointment of the Attorney General is legislated for by the Justice Act 2002. The legislation determines that the Attorney General is appointed by the First Minister and myself acting jointly, and we are currently looking at options on how best to take this forward. Well, Patsy McLoon. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, the Minister for our answers up until now. Um, would the Minister agree that um, the changes to the guidance of the Office of Attorney General need to be reviewed to ensure a, that there is no potential for conflict or, indeed, any influence, political or otherwise, upon the scope, role or work of that office? Yeah, so I, th I think in terms of the previous answer where I said we have to get to a point where there are no conflict of interest, real or perceived, so I think we need to look at all of those things and in terms of the guidance, um, the current guidance sets at play, I think we would be able to look at all of those things in terms of an appointment process if and when we re uh, replace the Attorney General. I call Trevor Lund. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, the, the Minister has been very uh, coy about hiding behind procedure and so on here, but... Would you not agree with me that an absolutely clear conflict of interest for somebody to hold the position of Attorney General and also be a High Court judge, and this should not be allowed to proceed. It should be stopped in source. Well, I'm sure the member would agree that we shouldn't just throw caution to the wind and just go with our gut. We need to actually follow process, and I am determined to follow process, and that's why we've sought additional information around the conflict of interest. And once I'm satisfied about that, then we're more than happy to move forward and take new action. Paul Christopher Salford. Speaker, would the Deputy First Minister agree that it is absolutely imperative that any appointment process to replace the Attorney General is not meddled with by politicians trying to make political points? I can agree that any public appointment process needs to follow the due process. Order now. Order, members. Order. Order. I call Liz Kimmins for a question. The Compact Civic Advisory Panel will be reconstituted through a public appointments process, which will be scheduled for completion within the, within the six-month period as required by the new decade new approach deal. 
There will be an important role for the panel in advising the executive on approaches to engagement on complex policy issues. An important initial task is therefore to review the existing remit of the Compact Civic Advisory Panel and to design a specification for the role of panel members to set out the qualities and experience we will be seeking from potential candidates. In light of the panel's uh, remit to convene one Citizens' Assembly each year, we will also look at good practice elsewhere. Ms. Kimmon, supplementary. Thank the Joint First Minister for her response. And given the challenges facing the Executive, how will issues be prioritised to ensure a maximum strategic benefit from the panel's work? Well, the Member is right that there are many um, issues facing this Executive, not least the budgetary situation. That said, it's essential that the Executive decision making is, is, is as informed as it can be. And going forward, it's essential that the Executive listens to, engages and works with the broadest range of stakeholders. Members of the Compact Civic Advisory Panel will bring an expertise and an insight that only can, uh, can only but inform the work of the Executive. This also evidences a step change in how we now do government. And on that note, I want to encourage as many people as possible who feel they have the skills to apply. It's essential that we see an advisory panel that is reflective of all our society in all of its diversity. I call John Stewart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, when it was announced in December 2016 that the Executive Office um, stated that the panel would consider specific strategic issues relevant to the programme for government and report to the Executive, given that the Deputy First Minister has had three years to think about this, what are the top three strategic issues she would like the panel to consider? Well, the Member will know that, yes, it was put in place in 2016, but because the Assembly didn't sit, then the, the work wasn't progressed. So we collectively have a job of work to do. We are a collective executive, we're a five-party coalition, so the five parties need to sit down and discuss what are the issues that we can discuss and what would be the first um, item that the Compact Civic Advisory Panel could take forward. Also, the panel itself, who we uh, nominate and put forward, will also have ideas, so it's time for um, a wee bit of outside thinking. If we're going to demonstrate this assembly is in a new mode, if we're going to demonstrate that we're working in a different way, then we need to work together as a five-party executive. They call Gemma Dolan. Question number seven. The next meeting of the North South Ministerial Council is planned to take place after the formation of a new Irish Government. The next scheduled summit meeting of the British Irish Council will be hosted by the Scottish Government in June. Gemma Dolan, supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Joint First Minister for her answer. Will the Executive Office ensure that the implications of Brexit are addressed as part of the ongoing work of these bodies? Yet the UK's withdrawal from the EU and the practical application of the withdrawal agreement will have implications for North-South cooperation as defined under Strand 2 of the Good Friday Agreement. They are not specifically issues that can be addressed solely through the North-South Ministerial Council. However, as has already been identified within the agreed protocol as part of the withdrawal agreement, it is envisaged that the NSMC and the North-South implementation bodies will play their role. The practicalities and the outworkings of this protocol, of course, still need to be considered and will be included on the agenda for discussion at relevant NSMC meetings. The new decade, new approach commits the Brexit subcommittee to initiate an assessment of the impact of Brexit on the institutions North-South and East-West relationships. Consideration of this issue has been in included in its forward work programme. I am of the view that the North-South Ministerial Council meetings will present an opportunity for Ministers North and South to discuss Brexit issues that may impact on their area, on their agreed area of cooperation. I call Jim Allister. If the um, ungovernable Irish Republic ever obtains a government, and if Sinn Féin is part of that government, when it comes to the North-South bodies, will the Deputy First Minister have the same concerns of imbalance that she and her party expressed in regards to perceived DUP influence on the Conservative government if it turns out that her party is sitting on both sides of the table in the north-south bodies. Will she then have any concerns about balance or was that just full outrage? Well, the member, given his legal profession, you think he'd be more in tune to the actual political situation? A very different situation in terms of the DUP's conference display deal was the fact that the British government have jurisdiction here. The Irish government do not. I would have thought that I would have thought that your legal mind would have picked up on that. But can I say this? I see no contradiction whatsoever 
in power sharing and making this assembly work and making this executive work, whilst at the same time articulating my ideological position towards a united Ireland. There is no contradiction in that whatsoever. And let me also say this, no one has anything to fear from the future of political change on this island. I call Orlea Flynn for question. I can call you question nine, question nine, please. In recognition of the importance of its work, the First Minister and I will attend meetings of the Working Group on Mental Wellbeing, Resilience and Suicide Prevention. Through its funding programmes such as Urban Villages and Communities in Transition, our department supports a wide range of projects which contribute to the mental wellbeing and resilience of both young people and adults. We hope to be able to contribute uh, insights through the experience of these programmes and share models of good uh, practice. Orlea Flynn, supplementary. Um, I thank the Minister for her answer. Can the Working Group give a commitment that it will help to fully implement the Protect Life 2 suicide prevention strategy um, and to secure the cross-departmental working required to reduce and prevent people suffering with mental health problems and suicidal ideation? Well, can I firstly acknowledge the good work of the member on this issue? She has been a champion in terms of mental health issues. Can I also say that um, I'm committed, myself and the First Minister, are committed to working with executive colleagues to ensure there's maximal, maximum cross-departmental working to reduce and prevent people suffering with mental health problems and also to provide support at the point of need. Um, as a former health minister, I'm very aware of the scale of the problem. I'm also acutely aware that so many people across society live with mental ill health problems. This is so tragically reflected in our worrying levels of suicide, self-harm and substance abuse. I know that many in this chamber and their families have also been touched by this issue. So the clear commitment from this executive to each and every one is that your mental health is valued, that you are valued and that you are not alone. I am therefore committed along with the First Minister with executive colleagues to make sure we work continuously to uh, maximise cross-departmental working. I call Dolores Kelly. Mr Speaker and Minister, I'm sure everyone will welcome a collaborative approach uh, by the Executive to tackling uh, mental ill health and of course it is important to get upstream because many people know the contributing factors. So therefore, uh, what additional budget will we expect to see next week towards mental ill health and tackling the causes of it? I don't have a particular or a specific figure, mostly because this work will come under the remit of the Department of Health. However, we all will input into it and we've um, focused an executive priority on it. Um, in terms of the individual programmes which contribute to try and promote mental wellbeing, I've mentioned a number of programmes across the, our, our um, department around urban villages, communities in transition, because as we know, mental health is, is something that um, arises, or, or um, poor mental health arises as a result of a whole combination of factors. So we need a whole society approach, cross departmental approach to be able to deal with it. Um, but I'm quite sure that um, if you write to the, the member or the Minister for Health, he could give you the actual figure. I call Mike Nesbitt. Uh, the Minister will be aware in Protect Life 2 the target is a reduction of 10% in suicides over a specific period based on World Health Organization guidelines. Would the Minister accept that that is effectively applying an industry norm to an incredibly abnormal situation and the only acceptable target is zero suicides? I absolutely agree in terms of zero suicide and we have to do everything we can to support people out there who find themselves living with mental ill health. Also, I think that it's a, a, a fact, which I'm quite sure the member is aware, that many people who die by suicide aren't known to mental health services. They have never actually sought support. So there's a societal problem which we need to address that, to encourage people to say it's okay not to feel okay and it's okay to ask for help. But that's a collective responsibility that we have as elected representatives, along with those professionals who work on the field, those people who work on the ground supporting and counselling people. I call William Humphreys. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would agree with the comments that the Minister has just made to the House. Can I welcome the joined-up approach that there is across government around this hugely difficult issue? Uh, I think it's important that government uh, departments here, working with uh, the likes of the Public Health Authority, local councils and service providers, come together and get a strategy with the issue across Northern Ireland. But could I also ju just take this opportunity to say that as a governor of two schools, that there's a huge amount of money in the budget of schools being put on frontline education money being used to buy in professional help. Can I ask the Minister for the de her department and across government to look at this issue and allow education monies to be spent on education? Okay. Yes, I I'm happy to take that issue up with the, the Minister for Education. 
Okay, members, so that, that ends the period for list of questions. We now move on to the 15 minutes for topical questions. And I call on Rachel Woods. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Deputy First Minister provide an update on the anti-poverty strategy that the Executive has committed to develop and implement as part of the New Decade New Approach Agreement? Um, it's still in early development and I'm very happy to write to the member and give her more detailed information. I, sorry, it was remiss of me to say welcome to the Assembly Chamber. This is the first time I've had a chance to engage with you. Um, but um, this is an area where we have to be serious about um, tackling poverty and it has to be, again, the holistic approach. I'm determined to make sure that we get the strategy delivered and that um, it's done within the time frame set out in the, in the new, de new Decade, New Approach document. I call it Rachel Wood, supplementary. Thank you, and I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, just given this, in paragraph 4.11, page 30 of the approach document, it states clearly that the future strategic level programme and the anti-poverty strategy will be underpinned by a budget and be ready for executive sign-off and endorsement by the end of March 2020. So given this, can you give a clear timescale for the anti-poverty strategy, including any consultation, or would it be a copy and paste exercise from previous executive promises that ignores the advice and recommendations from those working in the sector? Well, I can give the member an assurance that it will not be that, um, that we have an opportunity here to demonstrate different style politics, and that's what we're committed to doing. Um, I also believe very strongly in the role of consulting with those people who are the experts in the sector who are out delivering on the ground. So I think that crucially as part of, we, as we develop all of our programme for government commitments, that we need to make sure that we have proper consultation and also then that we also resource the, the pledges which we make to the public because there's no point in having a very lovely uh, document that sits on a shelf that actually isn't something that you can translate into something that makes a difference to people's lives on the ground. Call Keeve Archibald. Um, can I ask the Minister what engagement she has had with the NIO in respect of development of the regulations for the pension schemes for those seriously and physically injured during the conflict? Thank the Member for a question. Let me say that I am fully committed to providing for those seriously and physically injured during the conflict in an inclusive manner. On the victims' pension specifically, I have had no discussion with the NIO in respect to, of the development of the regulations for the scheme. Call Kiva Archibald for supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for her answer. Um, can the Minister advise if the resource for the victim's pension is um, coming from the block grant? Thank you. Well, um, as I said, I have no input into the development of the regulations. It um, very much came from the NIO, but uh, the policy was designed in Westminster, and it's my firm view that this should also be funded from Westminster. Call Daniel McCrossan. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, the Deputy First Minister may, may have seen the Lost Lives documentary on BBC One last night, which highlighted, among other atrocities, the Oma bomb. The families, of the, uh, and, uh, the families of the victims are still waiting in justice for that most heinous of acts. Will your office support the efforts of the Oma families to have a full public inquiry into this atrocity uh, as part of any agreed uh, resolution in dealing with legacy of the past? Can I, I didn't see the, the programme last night, but I can say that uh, we have to deal with the past in a way that's inclusive, that allows uh, victims to move forward. We have to deal with the past in the way in which we previously all had agreed at the Stormont House um, Agreement five years ago, which we still yet to see implemented. So we have a commitment in the new decade, new approach um, to legislate within 100 days. And when we meet the new um, Secretary of State uh, next week, we, we or this week, um, we intend to, to, to raise that um, issue with them. In terms of the OMA families, then I'm more than happy to do whatever I can to support those families in terms of um, receiving justice and actually getting access to what is important. Because I think at the end of the day, what um, anybody who's lost or hurt um, throughout the conflict deserves to be supported in the way that actually um, is important to them. Supplementary, Daniel McCrossan. I thank the Deputy First Minister for her answer. The Deputy First Minister will know very well that some years after the Oma bomb, Oma and its people, its community, its town is still suffering uh, from that uh, devastating event that took the lives of so many innocent people and has haunted Oma uh, ever since. Uh, will the Deputy First Minister uh, consider jo joining with the First Minister and visiting Oma to meet with community groups and to look and seek out some funding to support the regeneration of Oma town, which is still not recovered from that dreadful event. I can say that uh, both myself and the First Minister are keen to get out and meet communities and engage with people um, and we're determined to, to do that in a, a, as much as we possibly can. I'm more than happy to, to continue to engage with the member 
and others in terms of the regeneration of OMA and the west of the ban in general, because obviously there is a need to tackle regional disparities that existed, existed for many, many years, um, and we're determined to do that, and that's actually why it's referenced even in the new decade new approach document. Mr George Robinson. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could I ask the Deputy First Minister for an update on establishing the new mental trauma service for victims? Uh, discussions are ongoing between uh, the different stakeholders to discuss and implement the changes to the regional trauma network's governance structures to ensure that the voluntary and community sector groups that are representing victims and survivors are better represented at all levels um, of the RTN governance structures. It will, uh, the RTN itself will deliver a comprehensive regional trauma service building on existing resources and expertise in the statutory and voluntary and community sector. The network will focus on those who have experienced trauma and are suffering from PTSD. And we hope that phase one of the service will be launched in the coming months. George Robinson, supplementary. Thanks again, <coughs> Mr Speaker. Can you give a time frame for when the victims will benefit from this new service? It's still in, in progress. Um, we, we hope that phase one will be launched in the coming months. I don't have an exact date to give the member, but more than happy to keep the member up to date just in terms of progress. I call Daglan Magalier. Um, uh, uh, can the minister um, you know, give her a, a commitment to engage with the various groups you know, throughout West Rhone, and Oman, and other districts uh, as regards particularly victims and survivors' issues? More than happy to continue to engage with um, all groups, and I think it's important that we listen to the needs of all victims and that we engage and show leadership in terms of that engagement. So, happy to take the member up on that. Dagna Magali, your supplementary. Yeah, well, I'll join with the previous speaker in relation to the request to uh, come to the West of the Ban and to the Oma District and the District of Ban District to meet uh, many groups, particularly those who deal with the needs of victims and survivors. Gramaga. Oh, sorry, I'm happy to do that, yes. I call uh, Steve Egan. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Speaker. And may I also, from my behalf and our member, many members of this Assembly, to pay tribute to Breeze and Steve Quinn and the rest of the Quinn family. And may I ask uh, Deputy First Minister, since the Assembly, as you've just stated, is in a new mode, and obviously you're very much interested in victors, victims and survivors, whether she has asked her Finance Minister to publicly state as the Quinn family has asked to state openly that Paul Quinn was not a criminal, and if not, why not? Can Corlea, as I have already said, that Conor Murphy has apologised for his remarks and he has unreservedly withdrew his remarks. His apology was, was um, heartfelt and it was sincere, and he has offered to meet with the Quinn family, and I think that is the best way to proceed. Steve Egan, supplementary. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, and may I thank the Deputy First Minister for her answer. <laughs> As the Deputy First Minister knows, ministers are bound by the ministerial code, and in particular the Pledge of Office, which in paragraph 1.4, subparagraph C.G and C.A, which refers particularly to paramilitarism and paramilitary attempts to control communities. As the Finance Minister has previously stated that he spoke to the IRA, can he now give that information to the PSNI and our Garda Sikonia, or on Garda Sikona. And if he does not, would the Deputy First Minister agree that the Minister of Finance would then be in breach of the code and have him stand down? No, I will not. The Minister is not in breach of the ministerial code. He has previously spoken to both um, the PSNA and the Garda Sikona, and he has called on anyone who has information to bring it forward to both um, parties. Call Gemma Dolan. Could the Minister provide an update on the Social Investment Fund spend to date? Uh, the Social Investment Fund aims to make life better for people living in targeted areas by reducing poverty, unemployment and physical deterioration. The fund will run up until March of this year. The full £80 million budget has been committed to a total of 65 projects across the nine SIF zones. These include 46 capital projects which are delivering improvements to 107 premises and 19 revenue projects. To date, 34 capital projects and 17 revenue projects have completed and are delivering the benefits to the local communities. Total spend to date is 72 million, of which 35 million is capital and 37 million is revenue. I call Gemma Dolan, supplementary. 
I thank the Minister for her answer. And what outcomes have been identified from the SIF projects? The full impact of the projects will take longer to evaluate, but so far as we know, that over 45,000 people have benefited from the revenue projects, over 5,000 people through employment and training, over 28,000 people through early intervention, and over 12,000 people through projects focused on education. The physical improvements in the capital projects will continue to benefit communities for years to come. I call John O'Dowd. Uh, could the Minister provide an update in relation to the Minority Ethnic Development Fund? The budget for the Minority Ethnic Development Fund is just over £1.2 million. Funding awards run from 1 April 2019 to 31 March 2020. 69 applications were received to the 2019-20 fund and 38 were successful. The fund continues to be a key element of our policy for racial equality and good race relations in our society. It is intended to be aligned with and support our racial equality strategy, which runs from 2015 to 2025. The fund continues and will continue to support voluntary and community organisations to address the needs of people from ethnic um, backgrounds, including the traveller community. John O'Dowd, supplementary. Uh, uh, will the Minister outline the type of projects, or indeed how funding is applied to each of the organisations which are currently funded? Uh, funding awards fall into three broad categories or tiers. Uh, these are smaller amounts of up to tier one, sorry, is smaller amounts up to 10,000. They may be for one off events or for projects lasting up to one year. Tier two is for uh, covers amounts between 10,000 and 45,000 per annum. Funding is intended to meet central management, development, and administrative costs and to enable organisations to develop um, and provide services and projects. And then tier three covers awards between 45,000 and 75,000 per annum. Similar to tier two, funded in this category is intended to meet central management development and administrative costs to enable organisations to develop and provide services and projects. However, Tier 3 applications must also include clear proposals to provide a mentoring role with smaller or less experienced organisations and or to work collaboratively with others in the sector. And time is up as the next period of questions does not begin until exactly 2.45. I suggest the House takes these until then for a couple of minutes. <laughs>